Hi guys, my name is Alex, and today we'll delve into the case of a 17-year-old girl who stepped out of the cafe where she worked weekends and vanished without a trace. Police began finding one disturbing clue after another, suggesting something truly awful had happened to this girl. From the beginning, this case became Sweden's top news story, drawing in over a thousand people for the largest search operation in the country's history. In the end, they managed to uncover the grim truth, leaving everyone stunned at how such a tragedy could have happened. Lisa Holm was born on February 7, 1998, in the small Swedish town of Hovde. It was a quiet and peaceful place where she lived with her parents and older sister. Lisa was a kind, positive, and determined person. Even before finishing school, she decided she wanted to go to Australia and study architecture. Lisa also traveled a lot with her parents, seeing a lot of other countries. She was also quite independent. Since her teenage years, Lisa had been working at various part-time jobs to earn some money on her own. Before the summer of 2015, when Lisa was 17, she finally got her first serious job at a cafe about a 40-minute drive from her home. For the first few weeks, her parents drove her there, but soon her father decided to buy her a scooter. Lisa had a license for this type of transport, while she could only get a car license after turning 18. She was happy with this gift because she wanted to commute to work on her own. But for the first few weeks, her father accompanied her in his car since Lisa had almost no experience driving on the roads. She only worked weekends and her father accompanied her every morning and evening. This went on until June 7th, when he finally let her drive to the cafe alone. Somewhere around lunchtime, her parents decided to visit her at work and have lunch together. That day, the cafe was pretty crowded so Lisa was really busy with work. She took a short break for lunch, had a snack with her parents, and they went back home. At 6.23, Lisa texted her father that she was leaving work. But three minutes later, he received a call from her. He picked up, but no one answered. He heard some voices in the background and thought Lisa had dialed his number accidentally. The father thought she was talking to her colleagues and also heard the sound of a car door slamming shut. He called Lisa's name several times with no answer, then ended the call and began waiting for her to get home. But she didn't show up. An hour passed and Lisa's parents started to worry. She should have arrived by now, so her father immediately thought something might have happened to her on the way. It was her first time riding alone on the scooter and he was deeply concerned about her safety. He tried calling her several times, but Lisa's phone was off. After waiting a few more minutes, her father decided to hit the road, hoping to meet her along the way, since Lisa should have taken the shortest route. The father feared Lisa might have had an accident, so he drove at a slow pace, scanning the road. But Lisa was nowhere to be found. The man eventually reached the cafe without finding his daughter. Upon arriving at her workplace, he noticed Lisa's scooter parked in front of the building. By that moment, the man was already in a state of panic. Having been unable to find his daughter throughout the entire way, seeing her scooter, he immediately calmed down, thinking that for some reason she was delayed at work. However, there was no one in the cafe, and the man noticed something else. Lisa's scooter keys were left in the ignition, with a helmet hanging from its handle. All of this led him to believe that something bad had happened to his daughter. She would have never left the keys in the scooter, abandoning it in the parking lot unattended. Meanwhile, Lisa's mother called the cafe owner in hopes of shedding light on her daughter's whereabouts. But the woman claimed to have no idea where she could have gone. She had called her employees around 6 p.m. and they said they were closing the cafe. After the call from Lisa's mother, the cafe owner immediately got into her car and headed there. On the way, she called four of her friends who lived nearby and asked them to help with the search. When the cafe owner arrived at the scene, they, along with Lisa's father, began searching both the establishment itself and the surrounding area. Their last hope was that Lisa, for some reason, might have decided to take a bus instead of the scooter. They checked the schedule, and her mother, along with Lisa's older sister, drove to the bus stop in their town. Unfortunately, this version was not confirmed. Lisa was not on the bus, so her relatives immediately contacted the police. By that time, it was almost 10 p.m., and it already got dark outside. 
the police immediately launched extensive searches. The fact that Lisa's scooter was left in the parking lot with the keys led them to consider the possibility of abduction. Cases like this are quite rare in Sweden, especially in the remote provincial area where Lisa's town was located. Therefore, police immediately dispatched several groups with search dogs, while other officers began knocking on every house located near the cafe. When Lisa's classmates and her friends learned about her disappearance, they began spreading information about it on social media, hoping to attract more attention and possibly find some witnesses. The search continued all night, but it yielded no results. On Monday morning, the police department announced Lisa's disappearance to the public, urging anyone who has some useful information to come forward. Around the same time, a man who came to work at a barn right across the cafe discovered a motorcycle glove on the floor and reported it to the police. Detectives had already inspected this barn on the evening of Lisa's disappearance, but they hadn't noticed the glove there. They showed it to Lisa's parents, who confirmed that the glove indeed belonged to their daughter. This further supported the abduction theory, and the police deployed additional resources for the search. By that time, news of Lisa's disappearance had spread throughout the country, and hundreds of volunteers joined the search. On Tuesday, police received several more alarming clues. Volunteers searched the area along the dirt road located a few hundred yards from the cafe. There, they found a phone case, a receipt, a ticket, and a broken smartphone screen. Investigators immediately determined that all these items belonged to Lisa and focused the search in that area. Soon, they found other parts of the broken smartphone, Lisa's ID, and several more receipts. All these items were scattered along the same dirt road. After the discovery of those pieces of evidence, the police became almost certain that Lisa had become a victim of abduction. They threw all available resources into the search, and with each passing day, more and more people joined in. This case became the main news topic in Sweden, and hundreds of volunteers flocked from all over the country to participate in the search. A local volunteer organization specializing in finding missing people also joined the effort. All of this made Lisa's search operation the largest in the country's modern history, with over a thousand people participating in total. The police also received numerous calls with tips. One woman recounted that she went for a jog the day before Lisa's disappearance. At some point, a man who stood next to his car stopped her in the middle of the road. He spoke to her in English and asked for directions to a city she had never heard of. She tried to show him the way on Google Maps, but the man asked her to get into his car and show the route on his navigator. Naturally, the woman found this request quite suspicious, so she refused and continued running. She also shared one interesting detail with the police. The woman believed she had already seen this man among the workers who were repairing the same barn located across the road from the cafe. Lisa's colleagues also shared one observation. On the day of her disappearance, one of the witnesses noticed two men standing across the road from the cafe, looking towards the establishment. She didn't think of it much at the time, but after Lisa's disappearance, she decided to share this fact with the police. The next morning, on Wednesday, Lisa's father, along with some friends, went to search the dirt road where her belongings were found. Walking a bit further, he made several more alarming discoveries. He found Lisa's driver's license and her house keys. It all seemed as if Lisa was being taken along this road away from the cafe while the abductor was throwing her belongings out of their car or other vehicle they used to kidnap her. The police and volunteers concentrated all their efforts on this area, but no other items were found. That same evening, a friend of Lisa's father was returning home from the search. Passing by the cafe, he noticed that the police tape had been removed from the barn where Lisa's glove was found. The man decided to go inside and look for any other clues once more. He grabbed a flashlight from his car as it was already getting dark outside and walked around the premises for several minutes until something shiny on the floor caught his attention. When he looked closer, he saw a woman's earring and another one just like it nearby. The man reported this to the police, who showed the earrings to Lisa's parents. They confirmed that these pieces of jewelry belonged to their daughter. The police once again sealed off the barn and searched it more thoroughly. The lead detector later explained that on the first day of Lisa's search, their main focus was on finding the girl herself, so the barn was inspected not so thoroughly. 
They might have missed such small items as earrings, but now they brought in numerous forensic experts along with search dogs. This time, they noticed a rather unusual piece of evidence. Behind one of the walls, the police found human feces. At first glance, it may seem unrelated to the case, but the forensic experts put forward a quite interesting theory. They explained that when criminals commit serious and horrible crimes, their body produces an extreme amount of adrenaline, which sometimes leads to the uncontrollable need to relieve themselves. For example, it's common for killers to wet themselves before or during the murder. Considering that Lisa's glove and earrings were found in the barn, the police theorized that if she was indeed abducted, the perpetrator might have dragged her into this building. Therefore, detectives didn't rule out the possibility that this person, under the influence of adrenaline, couldn't hold it and relieve themselves, so these feces were sent to DNA analysis. On Friday, the search area was expanded and volunteers reached a farm located about two miles from the cafe. It was a complex of several large buildings where many people worked and the search team decided to inspect them all. However, shortly after they arrived, two men came to the farm. They didn't speak Swedish and communicated only in English. One of them said that the police had already been at this farm, but the search team leader didn't rush to believe it. He thought that he would have known about it if that were the case, so he decided to continue the search. The two men walked around the farm for a while, watching the volunteers and eventually drove away. About an hour later, members of the search team found a pile of branches behind the cow shed. Under it, they found a motorcycle helmet jacket, and headphones. The police immediately arrived at the scene and confirmed that all these items belonged to Lisa. They sent forensic experts to the farm for a more thorough search. Detectives also heard the story about the two strange men who tried to dissuade the volunteers from inspecting the farm. The police also recalled the story of a woman who encountered a suspicious man speaking English while jogging. In fact, they already had an idea who it might be. From the first days of the search, they had visited all the houses near the cafe, and in one of them lived two brothers from Lithuania, along with the wife of one of them. All three didn't speak Swedish and communicated in English. They were the only people within several miles who didn't speak the local language. The police also had other indirect reasons to suspect them. The brothers worked in the barn across the road from the cafe and at the farm where Lisa's helmet was found. They were familiar with these locations, and the dirt road where Lisa's belongings were found led to their house. Considering that there were no other suspects, the police decided to question all three of them. Meanwhile, forensic experts arrived at the farm. Together with the volunteers, they continued to inspect this area, and soon their attention was drawn to an old trailer. It was surrounded by tall grass and looked as if it hadn't been used in many years. But next to its door, the grass was flattened, as if something had been lying there recently. Some of the grass was also trapped under the door, indicating that it had been recently opened. As soon as the forensic experts opened the door, they were immediately met with a strong smell of decay. Inside the trailer, there were many lockers for clothing. Apparently, it was once used as a changing room for workers. All the lockers except one were locked leading the experts to suspect that Lisa's body might be in one of them. They began opening each locker and eventually saw that Lisa's body was actually in one that was left open, hidden behind a pile of old clothes and rags. Despite the small size of the locker, the perpetrator managed to fit their victim inside. Lisa had a rope around her neck and a large amount of tape over her head. Her pants were pulled down and her shirt was pulled up. Medical experts determined that Lisa died from strangulation. However, they found no signs of sexual assault. All of her clothing was handed over to the lab, while news of the discovery of her body rapidly spread throughout the country. All this time, the news of Lisa's abduction dominated headlines in Sweden. When her body was found and the public learned of Lisa's brutal murder, the case shook the entire country. Such crimes were extremely rare in Sweden, and people were shocked that someone could commit such a heinous act. On the same day that her body was discovered, something unusual and rather eerie occurred. YouTube users stumbled upon a video posted 13 days before the murder. The video was titled 13, and it featured a countdown timer. What was most unsettling was the name of the channel that uploaded the video. It was called Lisa Home. News of this video quickly spread throughout the media, 
leaving many people stunned by the series of coincidences. Some people began to speculate that someone had predicted the murder, but in reality, it turned out to be much simpler. It appeared that someone had just changed the channel name and video title after Lisa's body was found. Either this person wanted to spark another conspiracy theory or was just playing a cruel prank. Meanwhile, the police were doing everything in their power to find the killer as quickly as possible. At the time of Lisa's discovery, investigators had already brought in two brothers and a woman, and they all denied any involvement in the murder. They claimed that at the time of the abduction, they were at home, providing alibis for each other. According to their accounts, the older brother, Nerigis, was asleep in his room while his wife was preparing dinner, and the younger brother was on the computer. Nerigis also added that around 8 p.m., he woke up and went to the gas station where he bought pizza and cigarettes. The police were pretty skeptical of their alibis, as all three could have simply been covering for each other. They collected their DNA samples, but investigators still lacked any evidence directly linking any of them to the murder. However, this didn't last long. Forensic experts were working in the barn and on the farm, utilizing all available resources and manpower, and soon their efforts paid off. In the barn, there was a small, office-like room. It had a large window overlooking the cafe. Upon examining this room, experts discovered 15 different traces of male semen on the walls and floor near this window. It appeared as if someone had stood there watching the cafe employees, including Lisa, and satisfying themselves. These semen samples were immediately sent to the laboratory and experts quickly extracted DNA profiles from them. All 15 semen traces matched the DNA of the older brother, 35-year-old Nerigis. The same applied to the feces found in the barn. They also belonged to him. In the next room, which had previously been used for storing cow's milk, forensic experts noticed a pipe about two feet above the floor, covered in a thick layer of dust except for a small strip. The size of this strip perfectly matched the rope used to strangle Lisa. Traces of blood were also found on this pipe, and the DNA analysis confirmed it belonged to Nergis. On the floor beneath the pipe, they discovered a piece of the same rope. Experts examined it and identified two DNA profiles, Lisa's and Nergis's. This was a significant breakthrough for the police. It finally linked the man to the rope used to kill the victim. Furthermore, a hair belonging to Lisa was found on the floor of this room. Another crucial piece of evidence came from her jacket. DNA traces belonging to Nergis were also found on it. Based on these evidence, the police believed that she was killed right there. They pieced together an approximate sequence of events. Nergis had been observing the cafe for some time, and when Lisa was alone in the parking lot, he approached her. Based on the jogger's account, he could have asked Lisa for directions to a certain city or used some other tactics. Then, Nergis might have asked her to get into his car to enter the route into the GPS system. Considering Lisa was kind-hearted and always tried to help others, she might have agreed. Once she was in the car, the perpetrator taped her mouth shut and drove her to the barn. There, he wrapped the rope around her neck and hung her from the pipe. According to the medical experts, this sight likely excited him so much that he defecated on the floor due to an adrenaline rush. When she died, he placed Lisa's body in the car and drove to the farm, tossing her belongings out the window along the way. There, he hid the body in the trailer locker, covering it with old clothes scattered around. All of this, from the moment of the abduction, took the perpetrator less than an hour. Despite all the evidence, Nerigis continued to insist on his innocence. His wife and younger brother had to be released because there was nothing against them. Once free, they almost immediately left Sweden and returned to their homeland, Lithuania. The preparation for the trial was intense. Nerigis claimed he had worked in that barn for a long time, suggesting his DNA could have been present there due to his job. Additionally, he had an alibi provided by his wife and brother. Although there were serious doubts about the credibility of both sources, in court, this could have definitely worked in his favor. On the other hand, the presence of Nerigis' DNA on the victim's clothing could only be explained by direct contact with her on the day of the murder. The police also found a witness who saw his car near the cafe shortly before and after Lisa's abduction. 
According to them, the car passed along the road between the cafe and the farm several times at the same time when Nergis was supposed to be sleeping at home, according to his brother and wife. For several months after the discovery of her body, experts continued to examine all the available evidence using the most advanced equipment. Eventually, they uncovered traces of Nergis's DNA on almost all of Lisa's clothing, including the inside of her underwear. Considering that the whole country was still following the case, investigators continued to search for any other useful clues that could impact the legal process and further prove Nergis's involvement. They even went to Lithuania to speak with his wife and brother once again. The woman continued to insist that he did not leave the house between 6 and 8 p.m., but when it was the younger brother's turn, detectives suddenly got what they wanted. After telling him about all the evidence against his brother and detailing what he did with the 17-year-old girl, the man decided to tell them everything. He claimed that Nergis actually was not at home that evening and only returned around 7.30 p.m. He was covered in dirt and immediately threw all his clothes into the washing machine. When the police started to question all the residents and reached their house, Nergis whispered to his brother, tell them I was home at that time. Later, Nergis explained that he was afraid he would be framed for a crime he didn't commit because he was an immigrant and had no alibi for the time of the abduction. The younger brother truly believed that his relative had nothing to do with it, but after hearing about all the evidence, he realized it wasn't the case. Lisa's funeral took place only a month after her murder. The church where it was held could only accommodate 130 people, but there were many more who came to say goodbye to her. Organizers even decided to set up benches and large screens outside so that everyone could watch the ceremony. The trial began four months after the murder. This case once again captured the attention of the entire country, so everyone involved in the process was under tremendous pressure. None of them had the right to make a mistake. Nergis' lawyer insisted that his client's DNA could have ended up on the victim's clothing because he had worked in the barn. The prosecution, however, pointed out that this version made no sense, especially in the case of Lisa's underwear. The only way the suspect's DNA could have ended up there was if he touched the victim's underwear. The lawyer couldn't provide any other solid facts pointing on his client's innocence. At one point, he tried to push the version that the real murderer was Nerges' younger brother. According to this theory, the brother somehow took multiple samples of Nerges' DNA and placed them on the victim's body, as well as at the crime scene. However, the lawyer failed to explain the possibility of such manipulations with the DNA. The trial lasted for a month, and Nerges was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in a high-security prison. Given that this is Sweden we're talking about, the facility resembled more of a decent three-star hotel. His lawyer attempted to appeal the verdict, but the appeal was rejected. In early 2017, Nergis himself applied for deportation and transferred to a prison in his homeland. The reasons for this decision were unknown. Lithuanian prisons are significantly worse than Swedish ones, yet the court decided to approve his request. After all, providing comfortable conditions of detention costs Swedish taxpayers several hundred dollars per day for each individual inmate. Later that same year, his motives became clear. He appealed to Lithuanian court and his sentence was reduced from life to 15 years. However, the joy was short-lived for the murderer. A few weeks later, the court overturned his decision and Nergis was once again destined to spend his entire life in prison. Only now, he had no chance of returning to the comfortable Swedish cell. Five years later, in August 2022, Nergis faced yet another downside of being transferred to a Lithuanian prison. While inmates were being moved to another block, one of them attacked Nergis with a shank. He suffered serious injuries and died on the way to the hospital. As for his wife, the question of her involvement is still not entirely ruled out. Police noted that there is practically no chance of her direct involvement in the abduction or murder. In that case, experts would have found her DNA on Lisa's clothings or belongings. However, it cannot be ruled out that she knew of her husband's crime and helped him evade justice by providing a false alibi. Nergis' younger brother also raises questions. Cafe employees reported seeing two men standing near the barn and watching them. 
considering that one of them was likely Nergis himself, the second should have been his brother. However, the man's DNA was not found either in the barn itself or on Lisa's clothing, making his involvement in the murder unlikely. Perhaps they were indeed observing the young employees with the older brother and even discussing inappropriate things, but only Nergis decided to commit such a heinous crime. Gretchen Harrington was born on June 13, 1967, in Pennsylvania. She was the youngest of three daughters. Soon after her birth, the family moved to the small town of Brumel. Her father, who was a pastor, got a job at the local church. Gretchen immediately loved this town. She spent a lot of time outdoors with her sisters and new friends. Brumal was a safe place, so parents weren't afraid to let their children play outside until dark. With its rich nature and close-knit community, this place was more like a paradise for kids. Raised in a religious family, Gretchen spent a lot of time at her father's church. She also excelled in Sunday school, always getting top grades. On the morning of August 15, 1975, when Gretchen was eight years old, her family eagerly awaited the arrival of her mother and newborn sister from the hospital. Gretchen also wanted to wait for them, but her father encouraged her not to miss Sunday school to keep her perfect grades. Reluctantly, she agreed, took her Bible, and headed to church. Usually, she walked there with her older sisters, but they both stayed home that morning. Gretchen wasn't afraid to walk alone, as the church was less than a mile away, just an eight-minute walk from her house. The Sunday school lessons consisted of two parts. First, the children gathered at Trinity Church, and after about an hour and a half, some of them headed to Gretchen's father church. But at 11.30 a.m., when the kids arrived at the second church, Gretchen's father noticed that his daughter was not among them. It seemed strange, because the children were brought as a group, he thought Gretchen might have stayed at the other church, so he called there. Answering the call was the wife of the pastor, named David, who taught at the Sunday school. She said Gretchen wasn't there and told her husband about what was happening. He was surprised because Gretchen hadn't even attended his classes that morning. Her father immediately started to worry. He asked David to call the police and went searching for his daughter. The father drove along the route between the churches, checked other streets nearby, but Gretchen was nowhere to be found. He also reached out to her friend's parents, hoping she might have decided to spend time with some of them, but they were all either at church or home. Gretchen's best friend, David's daughter, also hadn't seen her all day. The police immediately began searching. As news of Gretchen's disappearance spread through the town, hundreds of volunteers quickly joined in. Practically, all the locals knew Gretchen's father, as they regularly attended his church, so they all wanted to help. Together with the volunteers, the police searched the entire town, then started combing through multiple wooded areas and the riverbank. A police helicopter was also sent to assist, scanning the area from above. The search continued into the night, but yielded no results. The next day, even more volunteers joined in. The police created flyers with Gretchen's photo and information about her disappearance, which were posted along roads and handed out to passing drivers. Despite all efforts, not only did the police fail to find Gretchen, but they couldn't even determine what happened to her. After several days of searching, they didn't find any significant leads at all, and Gretchen's fate remained unknown. Her disappearance became a heavy blow to the local community. People were used to letting their children roam the streets freely from a young age, and nothing like this had ever happened before. The kids could spend hours wandering in the woods, swimming in the river, without adult supervision, and their parents never worried. But now, all of that was in the past. The fact that no one knew what happened to Gretchen only added to their fear. People discussed various theories. Some thought she might have run away from home. Others believed she went swimming in the river and drowned. But the most frightening theory was that someone had abducted her. Parents stopped letting their children out unsupervised. One local woman even cut her daughter's long hair so she would resemble a boy. Once a safe and peaceful town, overnight it became a place where people lived in uncertainty and fear. The police also questioned anyone who might have had any connection to Gretchen's disappearance. During these conversations, they received several intriguing leads. 
one witness reported seeing a girl resembling Gretchen near the church that morning. A green station wagon approached her, but the witness didn't see what happened next. Another person shared a similar story, but this time they said a white Cadillac approached the girl. The police followed up on these leads, checked the owners of all vehicles matching the descriptions in the area, but couldn't establish their involvement. Four days after Gretchen's disappearance, detectives got a new lead. A resident of Westchester, located 30 minutes away from Brumall, called the police and said that he had found children's shorts matching the description of Gretchen's clothing. Investigators immediately showed them to Gretchen's mother, but she said they didn't belong to her daughter. From then on, there was no progress in the case for several weeks. The police called off the search operation and focused on the investigation. They continued interviewing people, following up on any available leads, but with each passing day, their hope of finding Gretchen alive diminished. This continued for two months, until October 14th, when a chilling call came into the police. A man went for a jog in a large national park, about a 20-minute drive from Brumall. There, he noticed something strange in the bushes. At first, he didn't realize what it was, but when he came closer, he suddenly realized it was a human body. He immediately ran to the park rangers to inform them of the discovery and they called the police. Officers quickly realized the remains were those of a child, but due to the extent of decomposition, identifying the child was extremely challenging. Detectives assumed it might be Gretchen, so they showed her parents photos of the clothing which had been left carefully folded next to the remains. Gretchen's mother immediately confirmed they belonged to her daughter because she had made those clothes herself. Soon, forensic experts confirmed it was indeed Gretchen by matching the remains with her dental records. They also determined that the cause of death was multiple severe blows to the head and the case was reclassified as a homicide. Due to the level of decomposition, they couldn't determine any other details, including whether the victim had been severely assaulted. Moreover, DNA analysis didn't exist in 1975, so investigators were once again left without any clues. News of the murder reignited the attention of the local community, and the police began receiving even more tips. People realized that a dangerous criminal could still be somewhere among them, so everyone wanted to see the perpetrator brought to justice as soon as possible. Investigators received dozens of tips about suspicious men spotted in the park area where Gretchen's body was found, but all these tips led to dead ends. They also checked everyone living within a few mile radius who had a history of violent crimes, but this yielded no results either. Several months after the discovery of the body, the case completely stalled, and there were no developments since then. Over the following years, the investigation was reopened from time to time. Detectives reviewed all available tips and leads, but each time, it ended nowhere. The main problem was that detectives had no evidence at all. Even when the police began using DNA analysis, it didn't help in this particular case because no foreign samples were found on Gretchen's remains or her clothing. As a result, the case remained unsolved for many decades. It was occasionally mentioned in newspapers and featured on TV, but only in recent years did Gretchen's murder once again reignite wide public attention. Two journalists, Joanna and Mike, decided to write a book about the crime. They worked on it for several years, gathering all available information piece by piece and trying to uncover new facts. Both journalists grew up in Brumall and were roughly the same age as Gretchen at the time of her murder. Joanna, who was only nine at the time, remembered it pretty well because it not only impacted her life, but also the entire town. After Gretchen's disappearance, children could no longer roam the streets or leave home unsupervised. They all feared that the perpetrator might strike again, and this fear haunted them for many years. Even young children couldn't help but feel how their lives had suddenly changed, so they all remembered Gretchen's murder throughout the years. To write the book, Joanna and Mike secured access to the case documents and spoke with many individuals involved in the case. They carefully pieced together the events of those days, detailing the entire story. This book was released in 2022 and immediately attracted significant attention to the case. 
However, its major impact came months later when a woman contacted the police to discuss Gretchen's case. She met with the leading detective to tell her story. The woman said that she was 10 years old at the time of the murder and lived in Havertown, just a short distance from Gretchen's home. She was friends with Gretchen and her older sisters, as well as numerous other kids in the area. She often slept over at her friends' houses. And one night, something horrifying happened. While she was staying at the house of two sisters, she woke up in the middle of the night to someone touching her. When she opened her eyes, she saw their father in front of her, who quickly left the room. She was afraid to tell anyone about it and stayed in this house for another night. The same thing happened again. Her friend's father entered the bedroom and started touching her. The following morning, she finally told one of the sisters what had happened. To her surprise, she answered that it happened quite frequently. The girl also said that her father sometimes came to her sister at night. When she returned home, she told her parents everything. However, instead of going to the police, they simply prohibited her from visiting her friend's house anymore. And all of this happened just a week before Gretchen's disappearance. After telling her story, the woman finally disclosed the name of this man. It was David Zanstra, the same pastor who taught at the Sunday school. But that wasn't the end of her story. She also revealed that a month after Gretchen's disappearance, one of her friends was twice approached by a man who attempted to abduct her. The girl refused to get into his car and later told her friends that it was Zanstra who tried to lure her somewhere. To corroborate her statement, the woman showed detectives her personal diary from that time. On September 15, 1975, she wrote about her friend's plea to keep it a secret, fearing that David Zanstra might harm her. After receiving this information, the police immediately reopened the investigation. Upon reviewing the case materials, detectives uncovered several suspicious facts that indirectly implicated David. As we remember, it was he who reported Gretchen's disappearance to the police. The pastor provided investigators with a detailed description of her clothing, dark blue zip-up shorts with front studs and pockets without zippers or buttons. He also mentioned that she wore a white top with her hair in braids. At the same time, he claimed not to have seen Gretchen that day. This raised a reasonable question. How could he know what clothes she wore that morning? Especially since, after her body was found, David's descriptions were confirmed. She was wearing those exact clothes. The detectives also learned that the Sunday school classes started about 50 minutes late because Zanstra didn't show up at the church at the usual time. It meant that he would have had enough time to abduct Gretchen, murder her, dispose of her body in the park, and return to the church to begin his lessons. According to David's testimony, which he provided right after Gretchen's disappearance, he drove some of the children in his van to her father's church after the Sunday school classes. He insisted he didn't see Gretchen that morning and only noticed her absence when her father brought it to his attention. Another intriguing fact was that David, along with his wife and three children, moved to another state just a few months after the disappearance. The pastor also owned several vehicles, one of which was a green station wagon. As we recall, a witness told the police they saw a similar vehicle approaching a girl near the church on the day Gretchen disappeared. Piecing together all this information, the detectives decided to speak with the man. At that time, he was 83 years old and lived in Georgia, so they drove there. On July 17, 2023, they met with him at the police station and began questioning him. When Zanstra realized the detectives suspected him of murder, he began to deny everything, asking them what exactly they got against him. They told him they had the testimony of a woman he had touched during a sleepover at his house, as well as a story about him molesting his own daughters. Upon hearing this, David was stunned, and pretty soon his demeanor changed completely. Understanding that his dirty secrets were exposed, he stopped denying, and 48 years after the murder, he began to speak. According to his account, that morning he drove to Gretchen's father's church in his green American Motor station wagon and saw the girl leaving her house. Waiting until there were no witnesses around, he approached her and offered her a ride. Without any hesitation, Gretchen got into his car, 
She knew David well because their families were friends, and she was also on her way to his Sunday school classes. But instead of taking her to the church, he drove her to a deserted park area, stopped the car, and told her to undress. Gretchen refused and said she wanted to go home, so Zanstra struck her several times on the head, causing her to lose consciousness. The pastor removed her clothes, satisfied himself, and then drove her to another park. Unable to find a pulse on her, he carried her body into the bushes and covered it with branches. After that, David drove back to the church to start his classes. Upon hearing his confession, the police arrested Zanstra for Gretchen's murder and extradited him to Pennsylvania. He was placed in jail awaiting trial, but for the police, this was just the beginning of a much deeper investigation. Considering that Zanstra had assaulted at least several girls, detectives strongly believed that there were likely other victims. The situation was worsened by the fact that the man worked as a pastor in many different cities and states for decades, so he could have committed numerous other crimes. Most of the time, he worked with children and he was deeply respected in society, which could have allowed him to avoid any suspicions. But now, when the truth finally came out, Detectives took his DNA sample and began searching for matches in other unsolved cases. They also looked into unsolved disappearances of girls in the cities where David had been working. Unfortunately, it didn't take long to find the first possible connection. Investigators quickly came across the disappearance of four-year-old Amanda Campbell from California, which occurred in 1991. Like Gretchen, she walked out of her home in a quiet neighborhood and vanished without a trace. At the time, David Zanstra worked as a pastor in that same neighborhood. Right now, there is no evidence against him, but the police say this case has several striking similarities to Gretchen's abduction, and the pastor could be the same perpetrator. They are also continuing to investigate his possible involvement in other crimes. Considering that all of this is happening right now, we may learn a lot more in the coming months. As for the trial for the murder of Gretchen, it has not yet begun. It is possible that David's lawyers will want to prolong the process and advise him to retract his confession. In that case, the trial could drag on for years and there are no guarantees that the man will live to see the verdict. Candace Rogers, who went by Candy, was born on July 18, 1949 in the American city of Spokane, Washington. She was the only child in the family, and shortly after her birth, her parents divorced. Her father stayed in the same city, so they spent time together pretty often. Candy was a typical, lovely child who enjoyed strolling outside with her friends, spending time in nature, and playing with her dog. She also had dreams of joining the Campfire Girls, a popular organization in those days, similar to the Boy Scouts, but exclusively for girls. They learned various useful skills, went on hikes, and enjoyed their time together as a group. In 1959, when Candy was nine, she finally had the chance to join this organization, and she was thrilled about it. One of the Campfire Girls' responsibilities was selling mints, the organization provided them with boxes of sweets and they had to go door to door, offering residents to buy them. On Friday, March 6th, Candy was supposed to do this after school. She returned home, had dinner, played with her dog, and around 4 p.m., she took about eight boxes of mints and headed out. Candy planned to walk through nearby streets and offer sweets to her neighbors. Other girls were also supposed to visit houses in this area, but they had pre-allocated streets to avoid overlapping and offering sweets to the same people. A few hours later, her mom began to worry as Candy still hadn't returned. She was supposed to be home by 6 p.m., but she was clearly delayed. With darkness falling, her mom decided to go out and search. Accompanied by Candy's grandfather, they walked the streets of their neighborhood but Candy was nowhere to be found. Soon, some family friends and neighbors joined the search, wanting to help. But despite their efforts, they couldn't find any traces of Candy, so her mom decided to call the police. By that time, the streets had already darkened, and it had become increasingly clear 
that something bad might have happened to Candy. The police quickly joined the search, starting by questioning all the neighbors. They soon discovered that Candy had only sold one box of mints. This indicated that something might have happened to her shortly after leaving home. But one resident claimed to have seen the girl on a nearby street around 6.30 p.m. This was weird because by that time, Candy's mom was already out searching for her. Candy's grandfather also shared strange observations. When he went in search of his granddaughter and arrived on the same street mentioned by the witness who saw the girl, he almost got struck by a speeding car that even hit the curb. Unfortunately, he didn't see the license plate but remembered it was a green 1953 Ford. Police distributed a description of the car but weren't able to track it. Around 9 p.m., they discovered several mint boxes strewn along the road near a bridge. It was clear that these boxes belonged to Candy, heightening the overall concern. The police focused their search in this area, combing both riverbanks along with a small wooded zone on either side. They scoured the area all night but couldn't locate Candy. By morning, news of Candy's disappearance spread through local newspapers and soon, statewide media started covering the case. In 1959, child disappearances near their homes were unusual because it happened extremely rarely. The residents of Candy's town hadn't faced such a case in many years, leaving them deeply disturbed. Early the next day, police ramped up their efforts, deploying more officers. Mounted police, off-road vehicles, and even military personnel scanning the land from helicopters joined the search. Additionally, a vast number of volunteers, both from the city and nearby areas, joined the search efforts. In total, over a thousand people participated in the search, making it one of the most extensive in the country's history at that time. The search area extended to 11 miles around the girl's home, yet they still couldn't find her. On the same day, another tragic event unfolded. A helicopter involved in the search clipped power lines and crashed, resulting in the loss of three out of the five crew members. Search efforts persisted for many days, yielding no results. Police officers continued working literally around the clock in multiple shifts, trying their best to locate Candy. Investigators received approximately 750 tips in the initial days of the search, diligently checking each one but all led to dead ends. Fifteen days later, two military members from the local base went into the woods west of Spokane on a hunting trip. There, they noticed children's shoes on the ground, immediately recalling Candy's disappearance. Many military members had been involved in the search, so they were all well aware of the case. They reported this discovery to the police, who showed the shoes to Candy's grandfather. He confirmed that the shoes indeed belonged to his granddaughter. The police headed to the woods for the search. Within minutes, one of the officers spotted a foot sticking from the bushes and found the girl's body. She lay amid the underbrush, covered with pine branches. Medical experts determined that the cause of death was strangulation. The perpetrator had used a torn piece of fabric from her skirt for this. Marks on Candy's hands and feet indicated she had been bound, although no ropes were found near the body. They also concluded that the victim had been sexually abused. During the search of the crime scene, police found a green car seat cover nearby, but they couldn't establish whether it had any relevance to the murder. On Candy's clothing, officers noticed a small purple stain that smelled like grape-flavored chewing gum, yet once again, they couldn't establish any connection to the case. Lacking any substantial leads that could lead them to the killer, the police tried to find any possible clues. Investigators sifted through incoming tips and explored the possible involvement of hundreds of individuals, neighbors, various suspicious characters, and previously convicted criminals. Soon, they focused their attention on a 50-year-old man named Alfred Graves, the reason he became a suspect was quite peculiar. He took his own life on the same day Candy's body was discovered. He did it right in his car, not far from where the mint boxes were found. 
he also lived just a few hundred yards from Candy's home. When the police found Alfred's body, they discovered a rope and woman's hairpins in his car. Investigators obtained a search warrant for his house, where they found numerous newspaper clippings detailing articles on sexual crimes against women and girls. The police also learned that several women had accused him of harassment, and even his wife admitted suspecting him of Candy's murder. Despite this troubling chain of events, investigators couldn't find any evidence linking Alfred to Candy's murder. They hesitated to clear him of suspicion, but proving his guilt seemed impossible. Detectives delved into other suspects, whose numbers kept growing. Several months after the murder, they had an extensive list of names, spanning multiple pages, and the police diligently checked each one. Yet, every time, they failed to find evidence of their involvement. Later, investigators had another suspect, a serial killer named Hugh Morse. He was arrested in 1961 for a series of crimes, and the reason why he became a suspect was pretty interesting. Hugh was known for constantly chewing grape-flavored gum. As we recall, a similar substance was found on Candy's clothes. Another reason to suspect him was that he killed two women in Spokane a few months after Candy's death. Hugh began committing crimes pretty early. His first arrest was for assaulting a woman, but he faced no real consequences. He was simply discharged from the army where he was serving at the time. Later, he committed a series of robberies in Los Angeles and served only six months. After his release, he lured two eight-year-old girls to a secluded area, promising them ice cream. He sexually assaulted them and was arrested once again. Surprisingly, he managed to avoid prison. A medical commission deemed him a sexual psychopath, so he was placed in a mental health facility. After two years, doctors believed he was cured and released him. Hugh moved to Spokane, where he started peeping into women's windows. In November 59, he broke into a 28-year-old woman's home, assaulted and killed her. Ten months later, he entered a 69-year-old woman's residence, repeating the same actions as with the previous victim. A month later, he assaulted another woman, stabbing her multiple times, but she survived. After these crimes, he left the city and over the next few months committed numerous other offenses, attacking women and girls with a knife, sexually assaulting them, and killing two more victims. Hugh always traveled between different cities and states until the FBI took on his case. He was added to the list of the country's 10 most wanted criminals and was soon captured. He was sentenced to multiple life terms and Hugh attempted to end his life in his cell. However, he was saved by the guards and continued to serve his sentence. Detectives in Candy's case repeatedly visit him in prison, but the man denied any involvement. He also went through a polygraph test, which indicated he was telling the truth. However, this tool carries no weight in court due to its questionable accuracy. Considering Hugh's biography and the fact that he lived in Spokane at the time of the murder, investigators viewed him as their primary suspect. But he continued to deny any involvement, and the police lacked any evidence linking him to the killing. Later, the police focused on another suspect, a 49-year-old man named Howard Barnett. In February 1960, he was arrested on suspicion of molesting a minor girl. A few days after the arrest, he took his own life in his cell at the Spokane police station. Before this, he wrote a message on the wall in his own blood, stating, I have a sin before the Lord. His wife learned of her husband's arrest only after his death. Speaking to the police, she asked if he killed that girl, referring to Candy. Detectives began investigating his potential involvement, yet, once again, they failed to find any evidence of his guilt. Howard remained one of the main suspects, mainly because he lived on the next street to the victim. Over the course of many years, police continued their efforts on this case, gathering new leads and examining other suspects. At one point, a woman contacted them, claiming that on the day Candy disappeared, she saw a green car following the girl. Investigators once again focused their efforts on locating this specific vehicle. However, 
this didn't lead to any substantial results. Although, it was strange that this woman chose to reveal this information many years after the crime. In the following decades, this case was reopened from time to time, but detectives always hit a dead end. Interestingly, they not only had to search for new leads, but also fend off false confessions. In total, 13 individuals confessed to Candy's murder, but in each case, the police concluded that they were lying. These individuals couldn't provide any information that only the killer would know, often just repeating details from the newspapers. Surprisingly, such behaviors are common in high-profile cases. For some reason, people confessing to crimes they did not commit. Throughout the time, the police department saw numerous changes in detectives, each hoping to solve this crime. Candy's murder stood out as one of the most prominent and mysterious cases not only in their city but across the entire state. It impacted a significant number of people. Before the murder, parents felt safe letting their children play outside, but after this case, many reconsidered their views on safety. In the early 2000s, this case was reopened once again, and this time, a new detective decided to use modern technologies. Fortunately, in 1959, the police had diligently collected and preserved all the evidence, which allowed experts to find a sample of male semen on Candy's clothing. Considering it had been stored for several decades, examining the sample proved extremely challenging. But after extensive efforts, experts managed to extract a DNA profile. They uploaded it to the FBI database but unfortunately, there was not a single match. Detectives also cross-examined the profile with samples from numerous suspects, but none of them turned out to be Candy's killer. Throughout all these years, many were convinced that Hugh Morse was behind the crime. However, the forensics indicated he had no connection to this murder. As a result, the investigation once again hit a standstill. The police had a DNA sample from the person who sexually assaulted and killed Candy, but uncovering their identity remained quite a challenge. The case was once again reopened in 2021, and a new detective decided to try an innovative DNA analysis method, genetic genealogy. This technique had successfully solved hundreds of cold crime cases, and the detective hoped it would finally bring closure to one of the longest standing investigations. He contacted several laboratories specializing in this analysis, but there he was faced with disappointment once again. To utilize this method, experts needed to examine the original DNA sample. Several attempts were made, but each laboratory concluded that the semen sample had degraded too much, so it was impossible to extract the necessary data. The detective turned to a final laboratory, and unexpectedly, there was a long-awaited breakthrough. Using cutting-edge tools, the experts successfully studied the sample, providing them with the required profile of the perpetrator. They uploaded the profile to genealogical databases, initiating the search for distant relatives of the DNA owner. Through meticulous efforts, examining thousands of individuals, they narrowed down their focus to one specific family. Upon investigating this family, they found that the DNA sample most likely belonged to one of three brothers. However, a new challenge arose as all three were deceased. Nonetheless, the experts and the detectives discovered that one of the brothers had a daughter, and the police contacted her. The woman was shocked at the possibility of her father being the killer of a little girl, yet without hesitation, she agreed to assist. She provided her own DNA sample, and the experts confirmed that she was closely related to the individual whose semen was found on Candy's clothing. With these results, detectives swiftly obtained a court order for the exhumation of her father's grave. Experts extracted a DNA profile from his remains, and after 62 years since the murder, the identity of the perpetrator was finally revealed. It was a man named John Hoff. The analysis revealed a complete match between John's DNA and the semen found on Candy's clothing. Despite having hundreds of suspects throughout the years, John Hoff was never on that list. 
Investigating his biography, detectives discovered his involvement in other crimes. At the time of Candy's murder, he was 20 years old and lived less than a mile from her house. He also served in the army, stationed at a base near where the girl's body was discovered. Two years after the murder, he attacked a woman, bound and sexually assaulted her, and attempted to kill, but she managed to survive. John was arrested and sentenced to only six months in prison. He was also disgracefully discharged from the army. Upon release, John started a family, having four children, two sons and two daughters. He remained off the police radar, living a seemingly ordinary life. John changed jobs several times, and once, while working in a food packaging plant, he suffered a severe chemical burn to his face, leaving a lasting mark. His life came to an end in June 1970, 11 years after Candy's murder, when John took his own life without leaving a note. Police also determined that the victim might have known him Candy was friends with his sister, who was 10 years old at the time. All these years later, she told detectives that after her friend's murder, she cried in her brother's arms, unaware that he was the one who killed Candy. Unfortunately, the girl's parents did not live to see the moment when the killer's identity became known. Candy's mother passed away in 2006, and her father took his own life in 1963 four years after the tragic event. The reason for this remains unknown, leaving only speculation that he couldn't cope with the loss of his own daughter. Nevertheless, this case was finally solved, marking it as one of the longest investigations. Over 62 years, it involved not just different detectives, but different generations. During the press conference, where the police announced the name of the killer, only one officer who worked on the investigation in 1959 was present. He thanked God, allowing him to live such a long life and eventually learn the truth. As for John's daughter, initially she couldn't believe that her father committed such a heinous crime. Later, she accepted this fact, calling her father a monster who took the life of an innocent girl. She expressed regret that he was not held accountable during his lifetime. Interestingly, John took his own life exactly when his daughter turned nine, the same age as Candy. Whether there's any connection remains unknown and we may never find out. Angie Hausman was born on February 18, 1984 in St. Louis, Missouri. Her father left the family before she was born and she never knew him. When she was one year old, Angie's mom married a man named Ronald, and they had a son. He and Angie got along pretty well, and she adored her younger brother. Angie was a very easygoing child, always seeking friendship with everyone around her. Her family lived in a quiet suburban area of St. Louis. In 1993, when Angie was nine, she attended the fourth grade at elementary school, located just over a mile from her house. To get there, she used to take a bus from the nearest stop, and her parents felt relatively safe letting her go alone because it was located just a few hundred yards from her house. Usually, Angie walked to the bus stop with some neighborhood kids. After school, they were watched over by several parents along the road from their windows. It became a sort of tradition among neighbors to ensure the children safely made their way from the bus stop to their homes. On November 18th, Angie, as usual, went to school and finished around 3 p.m. She took the school bus to her stop with a few neighborhood kids, and they walked home together. The other kids lived closer to the bus stop, leaving Angie alone about halfway. It was only a few minutes' walk, but time passed, and Angie didn't show up. About half an hour later, Angie's parents started worrying. She often stopped to chat with the other kids, but it had never taken this long before. Her mom and stepdad decided to go outside and walk along the route from their house to the bus stop. They spoke with other kids from the same school, who confirmed that Angie arrived with them and headed toward home. The parents also spoke with neighbors who usually kept an eye on the kids from their windows, but both women were busy that day and didn't witness anything. 
Angie's parents and their friends quickly initiated the search. They began scouring the area along the route from the bus stop to Angie's home. This continued into the evening, and as darkness fell, Angie's parents decided to call the police. Officers immediately joined the search. Given the cold weather, it appeared unlikely that Angie would wander off on her own, prompting the police to initially explore worst-case scenarios. Adding to their heightened concern was another recent incident. Just 10 days prior, in a nearby area, an unknown perpetrator had nearly abducted an 11-year-old girl. He approached her as she got off the school bus and attempted to drag her into the bushes, but she managed to escape. Since the assailant was still at large, the police considered the possibility of his involvement in Angie's disappearance. Officers called in canine units, and the dogs picked up Angie's scent near the bus stop. They tracked it roughly halfway to her house, before abruptly losing it. This suggested that Angie may have gotten into a vehicle at that point, further indicating a potential abduction. The police also deployed helicopters with thermal sensors and searched the banks of a small stream near Angie's home, but they found neither the girl nor her belongings. Unfortunately, the first day of searching yielded no results. By morning, the police turned to the media, and information about Angie's disappearance quickly spread across the city. In just one day, the police department received over 300 calls. To handle this influx of leads, they had to involve more than 20 new officers, yet all these leads did not help them find the girl. Detectives explored all possible scenarios and from the early days began scrutinizing Angie's stepdad. The man claimed no involvement in her disappearance and insisted he would never harm her. He agreed to a polygraph test and any other checks so that the police would stop wasting their time on him and focus on finding Angie. Investigators also located Angie's biological father, and here, they discovered something weird. The man had never interacted with his daughter, but according to her mother, he had driven past their house several times, watching Angie play outside. Detectives found this suspicious, but the man had an airtight alibi. On the third day, the FBI joined the case, and the police department shifted even more officers to it. They all understood that something terrible must have happened to Angie. She just couldn't have survived on the streets in such cold weather. At one point, the police received a lead about a possible suspect. Someone reported a strange man slowly driving a blue sedan in Angie's neighborhood. His description matched the account of the girl who had narrowly escaped an abduction just 10 days before Angie's disappearance. Investigators decided to create a composite sketch of this person. It was featured in the news, and volunteers distributed thousands of flyers, but the identity of this man remained unknown. Soon, the girl's disappearance made it to national television, attracting even more leads. Police diligently examined each one, but none brought them closer to finding Angie. Due to the heightened attention to this case, psychics quickly got involved, calling Angie's home and sharing their alleged visions. One of them claimed that the girl was alive and even specified a location where she was being held, a large national park 25 miles from Angie's home, but detectives paid no attention to their words. A $10,000 reward was also offered for any information about Angie's whereabouts, leading to an increase in tips. During the investigation, detectives uncovered a pretty disturbing fact. A few days before her disappearance, Angie told her teacher that she was planning to go on a nature trip with her uncle. The catch was, there was no uncle, and her parents had no idea what their daughter meant by that. Investigators considered the possibility that Angie might have known her abductor prior to the incident and referred to him as her uncle in the conversation with her teacher. However, they didn't find anything about this mysterious man. In the following days, detectives made no progress, but everything changed on November 27th. Nine days after Angie's disappearance, a hunter called the police. He had arrived at the national park and spotted a human body in the woods. Upon arrival at the location, the police were confronted with a horrifying scene. There was a body of a girl tied to a tree, missing any clothing and her head was entirely wrapped in tape, except for her nose. Her hands were also bound with handcuffs. 
Near the site, there was a bag with items, which helped the police immediately realize they had found Angie's body. Her belongings, including notebooks with her name, were in the bag. The body was handed over to medical examiners, revealing even more shocking details. As soon as they removed the tape from her head, experts found a piece of underwear in her mouth. They also determined that the girl had died just a few hours before the discovery, meaning she had been kept alive for nine days and then taken to this location where she froze to death. Experts had concluded that the victim had suffered numerous injuries and had been sexually assaulted. Forensic analysts carefully examined all items found at the crime scene and managed to find a fingerprint on the tape used to wrap Angie's head. They tried to find matches in the database and among several suspects, but it led to no leads. After the discovery of the body, the police dedicated even more resources to the investigation. Local residents were shocked by such cruelty and feared for their children, escorting them everywhere, meeting them at bus stops, and not letting them out of their sight for a moment. Just a few days after Angie's discovery, their concerns heightened even further. On December 1st, a 10-year-old girl named Casey disappeared. She lived in another town, only 10 miles from Angie's house. Casey had asked her mother if she could visit her friends who lived just a few hundred yards away, but she had never reached their house. Casey vanished on the way, and the police couldn't locate her. Detectives began to fear that they might have a serial killer on their hands. They didn't rule out the possibility that the same person was behind both abductions, but they had no evidence supporting this theory. Ten days later, Casey's body was found in St. Louis, and she was wrapped in two bedsheets and covered with a pink curtain, with the cause of death being multiple severe blows to the head. Detectives couldn't find any clues that would lead them to the killer. Moreover, they started to doubt that the same person who killed Casey was responsible for Angie's death. The nature of these crimes was noticeably different, leading them to consider the possibility of dealing with two different murderers. In the same month, detectives identified the man who had attempted to abduct a girl a few days before Angie's disappearance. He turned out to be 37-year-old Gary, who often came to St. Louis for work. He was immediately checked for involvement in the two murders, but the man had a solid alibi. He wasn't in the city during the disappearances of Angie and Casey, although during the investigation he admitted to assaulting four other girls and eventually received a five-year prison sentence. In February of the following year, detectives had found a breakthrough. When they discovered Casey's body, tire tracks were found nearby. Their photos were handed over to experts who determined that the tracks were left by a pickup truck widely used by a popular car rental company. Armed with this information, detectives interviewed residents in Casey's neighborhood, asking if anyone had seen a pickup from this company. Given that these vehicles were covered with vibrant brand logos, they were easily distinguishable from others. The detectives got lucky. One woman told them that she had seen the pickup from this company near her neighbor's house about a week after Casey's disappearance. Police quickly discovered that there was a woman living with her partner and brother. She claimed that none of them had rented such a pickup and they had no connection to this case. But detectives didn't rush to believe her. They obtained a search warrant for the house and found blood traces belonging to Casey in the basement along with the murder weapon. Further investigation revealed that the woman's brother, Thomas, had rented the pickup. Initially, he denied everything, but when confronted with the existing evidence, he finally confessed. According to his account, Casey had knocked on his door, wanting to invite his nephews to go to the street with her. He invited her into her house, took her to the basement, and attempted to assault her. When she screamed, he struck her with a heavy object and covered the body with bedsheets. After the murder, Thomas went to work, and upon his return, his sister informed him that she had seen the body in the basement. However, she added that she didn't want to know what happened, and demanded to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Casey remained in the basement for a whole week because active searches were underway, and Thomas was afraid to move her. When things calmed down a bit, he rented the pickup, took the body to St. Louis, and left it there. 
Thomas was eventually sentenced to death, but he died in prison from illnesses several years later. In connection to Angie's case, he denied any involvement, leading detectives to conclude that these crimes were, indeed, unrelated. The investigation hit another standstill for many months, with fewer and fewer leads coming in. Several years after Angie's murder, detectives faced another challenge, the expiration of the monetary reward for information, raising concerns about a decline in public assistance. However, an unexpected turn came in 2001, when a businessman in the community donated $250,000 as a reward for information on Angie's case. This generous amount of money, one of the largest at the time, led to a massive influx of tips for the police. But unfortunately, all of these leads proved to be dead ends. This continued until 2001, when detectives received a call from prison. Inmate named Corey Fox confessed to over 10 murders, including Angie Houseman's. Detectives rushed to speak with him, and Fox recounted how he and his friend abducted her from the street, keeping her captive in his house for several days. Initially, the criminals planned to demand a ransom, but concerns about potential identification led them to choose murder. To the surprise of detectives, Fox provided many accurate details, such as tying her to a tree, even specifying that his accomplice was using her underwear as a gag. However, discrepancies arose when questioned about how they restrained her hands. Fox claimed they used plastic handcuffs, whereas in reality, they used iron ones. Detectives also found out that Fox couldn't have committed some of the murders he confessed to. Police concluded that he likely fabricated parts of his confession, possibly drawing information from extensive news coverage on Angie Houseman's case. In the summer of 2002, another event reignited attention on Angie's case. In a different area of St. Louis, an unknown man abducted a six-year-old girl from her home and killed her. Police initially considered the possible connection to Angie's case, but it turned out otherwise. The perpetrator was apprehended just a few hours later. It was a neighbor who confessed during interrogation. Several more years passed until 2007, when detectives decided to revisit the case. Reviewing the documents, they noticed a peculiar detail. Shortly after discovering Angie's body, police noticed a parked car nearby with a man named Roger Martin inside. When questioned about his presence, Roger claimed he came to the area for hunting. However, upon a brief inspection of his car, the police officer found no hunting gear. This led the new detective team to take a closer look at Roger, discovering his criminal record for offenses against children. Moreover, he had assaulted one of his victims near the location where Angie's body was found. Remarkably, all of these crimes occurred before Angie's death, and this information was in the database. But during that time, the police did not thoroughly investigate Roger, prompting the new detective team to start from scratch. Roger was called in for questioning. He denied any involvement in Angie's murder, insisting he was near the location by chance. Roger added that during the time the girl was left there, he was still at work, although the police couldn't confirm this alibi. Despite a nine-hour interrogation, detectives couldn't reach any conclusive results. They took Roger's fingerprints, comparing them with the one left on the tape from the victim's head. Experts determined they didn't match, leading to Roger's release. While the police refrained from ruling him out as a suspect, they lacked substantial evidence to hold him. There was no progress in the case until 2018, when the St. Louis Police Department formed a dedicated task force. The new detectives aimed to re-examine all existing evidence. With significant advances in technology since 93, they hoped to uncover new leads. The detectives focused on three key pieces of evidence, the handcuffs, taped from Angie's head, and her underwear used to silence her. Despite repeated attempts since 93, experts struggled to find the perpetrator's DNA on them. Undeterred, they decided to re-examine these items with modern technology. Firstly, they attempted to find DNA on the handcuffs, but it was quite challenging as they were almost entirely covered in the victim's blood. They then turned to the tape from Angie's head, encountering another issue, 
when they opened the box containing this evidence, they found that the tape had literally disintegrated over the years. Finally, they examined the underwear, despite having little hope for this particular evidence, as it had been in the victim's mouth for several hours, potentially erasing any foreign DNA, they pursued it as a last resort. Employing state-of-the-art technology, they meticulously inspected every inch of the underwear, and at last, there was a breakthrough. A tiny sample of unfamiliar DNA was discovered, sufficient for analysis. Experts confirmed the DNA belonged to a male, immediately uploading it to the FBI database. In such cases, it's pretty common not to find any matches, requiring additional efforts to identify the person. However, luck was on detectives' side this time. As soon as the DNA sample was uploaded, they received a full match. The DNA belonged to 58-year-old Earl Cox, who had been in prison since 2003. Cox had never come to the police radar regarding Angie's case, but his criminal history was substantial. Earl first landed behind bars during his military service in 1982 in Germany. He had a part-time job as a babysitter until four girls reported that he had sexually assaulted them. Earl received an eight-year prison sentence in the USA and was discharged from the army. After serving only three years, he was released early and relocated to St. Louis. Four years later, Earl was arrested again when two seven-year-old girls accused him of sexual assault. Despite the charges being dropped due to insufficient evidence, his arrest violated the terms of his parole, leading to an additional year in prison. Upon his release in 92, he resettled in St. Louis, where his relatives lived. A year later, he seemingly abducted and killed Angie, but we'll delve into that shortly. In 2002, Earl faced another arrest for running a major anonymous internet platform where predators shared materials depicting child abuse. The FBI had been investigating him for a while, and Earl took the bait when an undercover agent posing as a 14-year-old girl contacted him. Earl expressed intentions to make her his slave, sent money for a bus ticket, and showed up at the agreed meeting place. Instead of a girl, Earl encountered armed FBI agents, resulting in his arrest. On his computer, they discovered 45,000 photos of child abuse, along with evidence that he was the mastermind behind the perverse platform. This information led to the arrest of 60 more individuals associated with the site, marking one of the country's largest operations against pedophiles. In 2003, Earl was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but when his term ended, a judge refused to release the offender, using a legal loophole allowing the detention of individuals deemed a serious threat to children. As a result, he remained behind bars, and in 2019, his DNA matched the sample from Angie Hausman's case. Detectives went to prison to speak with him. However, Earl denied his involvement and promptly asked for a lawyer. The police recognized that the man had little chance of winning the case in court, given the presence of his DNA, but they decided to try something else. Investigators reached out to Earl's lawyer, stating they would seek the death penalty for Angie's murder. However, if the perpetrator confessed, the prosecution would abandon the death penalty in favor of a life sentence. Apparently aware that he would likely lose the case, Earl agreed to the deal. Detectives returned to the prison, where he provided his version of events. It's worth noting that some parts of his story sounded outright implausible, but the crucial thing for investigators was the confession to the murder. Earl claimed that on November 18, 1993, he was driving through the area where his mother and sister lived. His car stalled in the middle of the road, and while he was trying to figure out what was wrong with it, a school bus pulled up, and several kids got off. They all went into their houses, except for one girl, Angie. According to Earl, when she approached him, they had a brief chat, and he noticed she looked freezing. He offered her a ride in his car, and as he claimed, she agreed. He then took Angie to Burger King, fed her, and brought her to his home, where he sexually assaulted her for several days. After some time, he decided to get rid of Angie took her to the location where her body would later be found, and tied her to a tree. Allegedly, she was still alive at that moment. Detectives doubted the truthfulness of certain parts of this story. 
Angie clearly couldn't agree to go anywhere with a stranger, especially considering she only had a short distance to walk home. Investigators also questioned the car breakdown in Earl's story. He claimed the car stalled, but as soon as Angie approached, the car surprisingly started again. More likely, the perpetrator noticed Angie and immediately decided to abduct her. He could have lured her into the car with some lies or even threats. It appeared much more realistic than Earl's version. Nevertheless, detectives obtained what they needed, the confession to the murder. In August 2020, he appeared before a judge who sentenced him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Unfortunately, Angie's mother did not live to see this moment. She passed away from cancer in 2016. Her husband, Ronald, told reporters that Earl should have been tried for two murders because he held him responsible for his wife's death. After losing her daughter, she lost all interest in life and essentially died. As for Earl, his story didn't end with the verdict. The prosecutor wanted to review the case of sexual abuse involving two seven-year-old girls for which the offender faced no consequences, serving just a year in prison for parole violation. Police reached out to one of his victims, now an adult, asking her to testify against Earl. The man, already destined to spend the rest of his life behind bars, admitted his guilt, and he was sentenced to an additional 10 years in prison. After the sentence was announced, his victim spoke in court. She expressed that despite Earl's heinous crime, she would lead a happy and fulfilling life while he rightly fades away in prison. Rebecca Gould was born on April 28, 1982, in the small American town of Melbourne, Arkansas. She had three sisters, but shortly after the youngest was born, their parents divorced. The girls stayed with their mother, but continued to spend time with their dad. At first, they struggled with their parents' separation, but eventually, it made them even closer with each other. They spent a lot of time together, always looking out for one another. After graduating from high school, Rebecca enrolled at Northwest Arkansas Community College and relocated to Fayetteville. One of her sisters was already attending this college, so they had the opportunity to see each other practically every day. The sisters always tried to visit their family whenever they had the chance. Even though their home was just about 25 miles from their college, sometimes it was quite challenging to find time between studies. In September 2004, when Rebecca was 22, she was anticipating the start of a new semester at her college. For a while, she had been considering transferring to the University of Arkansas, and finally, she got the opportunity. However, before making the move, Rebecca planned to complete one more semester at her current college. Before the semester began, she and her sister decided to go home for the weekend to visit their family. Rebecca also had a boyfriend who lived in a nearby town, she planned to spend time with her relatives and then stay with her boyfriend. On Sunday, September 19th, the sisters drove home, spent some time with their loved ones, and Rebecca left to see her boyfriend. The next day, she was supposed to pick up her sister and head back, as they had come there in Rebecca's car. However, she didn't show up at the agreed time. Her sister tried calling multiple times, but Rebecca never answered. At first, her family members didn't worry too much. Rebecca was an adult, and they thought maybe she was just catching up on sleep before heading back to college or spending time with some friends. But by the evening, as time had passed with no sign of Rebecca, her family started to worry. They now hoped Rebecca had just decided to stay in town for one more day and would eventually return home. The next day, their worry reached its peak. Rebecca still hadn't contacted any of her relatives, and none of her friends had seen her. That's when Rebecca's mom decided to contact the police. Officers learned that Rebecca had stayed with her boyfriend, Casey, and went to his workplace. He said the last time he saw her was the previous morning, around 8.30 a.m. Rebecca dropped him off at the cafe where he worked. She then planned to return to his place, pack her things, and meet up with her sisters before leaving. Casey added that Rebecca had promised to pick him up from work, but she never showed. He waited for her in the parking lot, then called his friends and they all went to a party. 
The police listened to his account and asked Casey to allow them to search his home, and he gave them permission. The first thing they noticed was Rebecca's car was still parked outside. Inside the house, they found her purse with IDs and her dog. Casey also mentioned she had a small suitcase with some clothes, but it was not found in the house. This started to seem odd. No one had seen Rebecca for a whole day, yet her purse, car, and beloved pet were still at Casey's place. But it wasn't all. One of the officers noticed the mattress didn't have any bedding and was placed on the bed rather unevenly. Lifting it, the police found large red stains resembling blood. The officers then searched the house more thoroughly and found more bloodstains on the floor and wallpaper. In the washing machine, they found bedding with bloodstains. They also noticed a significant amount of bleach bottles in the house, suggesting that someone had attempted to clean up bloodstains. All this pointed to a grim conclusion that Rebecca might not be alive anymore. Although, investigators couldn't find any additional evidence in the house. They also weren't sure if the blood belonged to her, as DNA analysis results would take several days. While forensic experts continued to examine the house, detectives began questioning Rebecca's boyfriend. He could have been the last person to see her before her disappearance, and a large amount of blood was found in his house. Casey stated he had no involvement in Rebecca's disappearance. According to him, the last time he saw her was the previous morning, and since then, Rebecca hadn't been in touch. He mentioned that after spending the night with friends, he returned home to change before his next shift. However, he insisted he hadn't seen any blood splatters on the floor or walls and didn't smell bleach. He also didn't think much of Rebecca's car parked outside or some of her belongings left in the room. The police didn't rush to take his word for it, but at that point, they didn't have any substantial evidence to suspect him of murder. They decided to interview all his friends with whom Casey spent Monday night, and they confirmed that he was indeed with them until the morning. They provided him with an alibi, and the police continued to look for any other clues. They still had no idea what happened to Rebecca and when exactly she disappeared. All they knew was that she hadn't answered any calls since the morning of the previous day. During the conversation with investigators, Casey had suggested they should look into Rebecca's ex-boyfriend named Justin. The police tried to reach out to him, but he wasn't home and didn't answer any calls. This seemed suspicious. He disappeared at the same time as his ex-girlfriend. However, two days later, he got in touch and said he had been at a casino with his father. The police were able to confirm his alibi and he was indeed out of town. Soon, detectives got another lead. They had been trying to reconstruct the timeline of events on the day of her disappearance and found out Rebecca had stopped at a gas station near Casey's workplace. She bought herself a sandwich for breakfast and headed towards his house. Employees recognized her from a photo and confirmed she came there after 8.30 a.m., aligning with Casey's account. The police also found the same sandwich in his house, untouched. This indicated that Rebecca returned home, and shortly after that, something happened to her. Considering Casey was at work at this time, it once again raised doubts about his involvement. Soon, the police received the results of the blood analysis found in his house. It matched Rebecca's blood, and experts didn't find any samples of foreign DNA among it. Detectives continued their efforts to solve the case by interviewing all of Rebecca's relatives and friends. They considered that if Rebecca was indeed attacked, it could have been someone close to her with a personal motive. Police also scrutinized all of Casey's friends who might have visited his house, but all efforts yielded no results. This went on until September 27th, a week after her disappearance, investigators discovered Rebecca's body approximately 12 miles from her boyfriend's house. It lay at the base of an embankment near the highway. This area wasn't visible from the road, making it nearly impossible to stumble upon the body accidentally. They also noted that whoever left her there hadn't even tried to conceal or bury the body. Apparently, the perpetrator just drove there, dumped her, and left. 
Medical experts determined that Rebecca sustained multiple blows to the head with a heavy object, and her cause of death was strangulation. No defensive wounds were found on her body, indicating that the victim was completely caught off guard, possibly without even having time to realize what was happening. Experts also found no evidence of sexual assault. Regarding the time of death, they also thought Rebecca's body had been lying there for a week, but experts couldn't provide a more precise estimation. Meanwhile, the detectives identified the possible murder weapon used by the perpetrator. There was a piano in Casey's house missing one of its legs. They were quite heavy, and medical experts confirmed that their shape matched the head injury on the victim. Casey claimed the missing leg had been loose for a while, and in theory, it could have been easily ripped from its base. However, the police failed to find this leg either in the house or near the location where the body was found. Given the complete absence of evidence, detectives began searching for possible motives for this crime. They immediately ruled out the robbery gone wrong. Nothing was missing from the house except for the piano leg and Rebecca's suitcase. A sexual motive was also dismissed, leading investigators to believe that the killer simply wanted to murder her. Considering Rebecca was killed almost immediately after her return to Casey's house, police speculated that the perpetrator might have been aware of her schedule or had been following her, knowing her boyfriend would be at work that morning. It was also very likely that Rebecca knew the perpetrator. There were no signs of forced entry, suggesting she might have let them in herself. According to investigators, the killer spent several hours in the house, attempting to clean up the blood with bleach. After that, they likely carried the body and loaded it into the car to drive it to the embankment. Despite all this, detectives had literally no evidence, so there was no progress in the investigation. They considered the possible involvement of hundreds of people, including acquaintances and relatives of both Rebecca and Casey. They also checked neighbors and even residents of nearby towns, but it led nowhere. Police received numerous tips, but none proved useful. In many cases, locals just voiced their suspicions against other people without backing it up with any real facts. This went on for several months until the case eventually went cold. Investigators continued to work on it, but they couldn't make any progress. In the following years, the case was reopened several times, passing on to new teams of detectives, but each time it led nowhere. The problem lay not only in the complete absence of evidence, but also in the lack of understanding the perpetrator's motive. Eventually, the mysterious nature of this case attracted attention from the true crime community. It became the subject of various TV shows and podcasts, where people attempted to finally uncover the truth. One such individual was a journalist named George Jared, who had been following the case from the beginning. He even wrote a book about it and launched his own podcast. For many years, he had been trying to find out who killed Rebecca. One day, he met Jennifer Buckholtz, a former counterintelligence officer in the U.S. Army, who was also interested in the case. They decided to join forces and created a Facebook group where they shared their thoughts on the investigation, discussing it with subscribers. In the first few months, they started noticing a subscriber named William Miller who caught their attention for two reasons. The first was that he lived in the Philippines. His interest in an unsolved crime in a small American town from the other side of the world seemed strange. Miller was also one of the most active subscribers, leaving numerous comments and even reaching out to the group admins via direct messages. He said he wants to help solve the murder, shared his thoughts on some controversial and unclear moments, and put forth his own theories. He demonstrated a high level of awareness, not only with specific facts from the case, but also with the knowledge of the area where the crime occurred. Eventually, George and Jennifer began to consider his behavior quite suspicious. They decided to keep this thought to themselves to not scare him off and try to extract more information. Soon, they discovered something else. One of the group members was an expert in genealogy and she tried to understand Miller's connection to the case. With a simple analysis of his profile, she discovered a very unexpected fact. Miller turned out to be Casey's cousin. 
After this revelation, George and Jennifer decided to contact the detectives on Rebecca's case and share their concerns about his activity. Police reviewed the case files and realized that Miller's name had been there from the beginning. It turned out he had visited the town around the time of the murder. In 2004, Miller was already questioned, saying he came from Texas to help another relative. He mentioned visiting Casey twice, two days before Rebecca's disappearance, and the next day. The second time, he didn't even enter the house. Rebecca spotted him through the window and informed Casey that someone was standing there. He went outside, spoke with his cousin for about 15 minutes, and Miller left. Back then, he didn't raise any suspicions, but now detectives were taking a keen interest in him. Digging deeper, they found out that Miller had been a suspect in several cases. In 2002, he faced charges of assaulting a minor and later for attacking his ex-wife after breaking into her home. However, he didn't face any punishment in either of these cases. Later, he moved to the Philippines, got married, had kids, and worked on offshore oil rigs. Police wanted to talk to him again, but without him being in the US, it was practically impossible. They also couldn't contact him, so they had to wait for him to return home. This happened only in 2020. Customs informed detectives that Miller came back to the US and returned to Oregon, where his mother lived. Detectives called her, but she claimed not to have seen her son for a long time, even though they knew he was in town. Realizing she was lying, detectives decided to go there and bring him in for questioning. Considering there was no evidence against him, the police needed a plan. If Miller had any connection to the murder, they desperately needed to obtain his confession. So, the detectives decided to play it smart. Detective Mike McNeil, who led the investigation, started the interrogation casually, stating they were just re-interviewing everyone involved in the case. Miller replied that he was willing to cooperate and had nothing to hide. The detective asked if he would be okay with taking a polygraph test upon his return to Arkansas. Miller agreed, and then the detective pretended to call the local police chief, asking if there were any polygraph specialists in town by chance. Hearing this, Miller became visibly nervous and tried to change the subject. Meanwhile, the detective pretended to talk on the phone and said that a polygraph specialist would arrive at the station in half an hour. What Miller didn't know is that the specialist was already waiting in the next room. Despite the fact that the polygraph is a pretty controversial tool and its results can't be accepted in court, the detectives had other goals. This unexpected turn of events could catch the suspect off guard and ultimately lead to a confession. Miller asked if polygraph results were admissible in court and the detective vaguely said they could be in certain scenarios but didn't specify how unlikely that was. Miller continued to get nervous but agreed to the test, which he failed. The polygraph operator concluded that he had lied about all key questions, including involvement in Rebecca's murder. Detective McNeil continued pressing him and told Miller that experts once again analyzed all the available evidence and found Rebecca's DNA in samples collected from his car. They had searched his vehicle back in 2004 but found nothing and hadn't even taken any samples for further examination. So, there was no Rebecca's DNA found in his car and the detective deliberately misled Miller. By law, police have the right to use such tactics during interrogation to get a confession. Sometimes criminals indeed decide to confess, and this was Detective McNeil's only hope. Upon hearing about Rebecca's DNA in his car, Miller fell silent. The detective kept saying they had all the evidence and Miller could only make things easier for himself by confessing. And it worked. Miller suddenly said that he didn't kill Rebecca but stumbled upon her body. According to him, that morning, he went to his cousin's house and found an unknown man in a mask standing over Rebecca's bloodied body. Clearly, the detective didn't believe this story and continued to push Miller to tell the truth. Eventually, Miller abruptly interrupted him and said, I'm just gonna tell you. I did it. I'm sorry for what I did. According to Miller, that morning, he went hunting in the woods near his cousin's house. 
When he arrived there, he suddenly remembered that Casey's girlfriend had come over, and for some reason, he wanted to talk to her. He knocked on the door and told Rebecca he needed to use the phone. She let him in, and Miller pretended to make a call. Meanwhile, Rebecca returned to the bedroom, and he began walking back and forth in the living room. Miller claimed he was overwhelmed by an uncontrollable rage and desire to kill Rebecca, so he grabbed a piano leg and went after her. She was lying on the bed, and Miller struck her several times on the head before strangling her. He then wrapped her body in a sheet, putting it in his pickup truck, and tried to clean the blood from the floor, walls, and bedding with bleach. He then drove to the highway and dumped the body under the embankment. Miller admitted he knew the area well because he went to the school in that town. After hearing his confession, the detective asked why he committed the crime. Miller replied that he just had the urge to kill Rebecca without any reason and couldn't control it. At the end of the interrogation, he once again repeated that he had regretted his actions all these years and must take responsibility. After that, Miller was arrested and extradited to Arkansas, but there, he suddenly retracted his confession and claimed his innocence, which could have jeopardized the case. By law, a suspect must confess to a crime before a judge, especially when there is no evidence against them. There was also one more problem. During Miller's arrest, the police officer didn't finish reading his rights because Miller had interrupted him with a question. All this could have potentially led to Miller's release. However, the judge deemed the recorded confession admissible. Miller had the opportunity to commit the crime, knew his cousin's work schedule, and his statements matched all the details of the crime. It is worth mentioning that Miller initially had a guaranteed way to avoid punishment, when the police called him in for questioning in Oregon, he could have simply refused or walked out of the station at any moment. Considering there was no evidence against him, Miller could have refused to continue the conversation, boarded a flight to the Philippines, and left the US for good, never to be held accountable. Extraditing him without evidence would have been simply impossible, and investigators would have had to accept the fact that they would never solve this case. But Detective McNeil believed that Miller himself had a strong desire to confess. His activity in the online group, where he left numerous comments and interacted with the admins, spoke to this. If he hadn't wanted anyone to learn about his involvement, the most logical behavior would have been to stay away from this topic. Perhaps he didn't leave the interrogation room or request a lawyer for the same reason. He simply couldn't live with all this guilt. Despite Miller initially claiming his innocence, he changed his mind again and struck a deal with the prosecution. In 2022, he confessed to the crime and received a 40-year prison sentence. But this story doesn't end there. When Miller was behind bars, he suddenly confessed to several more murders. He admitted to killing five more women throughout his life, whose names he didn't even know. According to Miller, he would invite those women in his car drive them to secluded places, and then kill them. He added that he chose his victims based on their appearance. He targeted young, slim, and short women with light hair. Detectives immediately realized that this description perfectly matched Rebecca's appearance. If Miller was indeed a serial killer, it would better explain his decision to kill his cousin's girlfriend as she fits his profile. Considering that Miller worked on oil rigs for 25 years, he had lived in multiple different states and could have committed all these crimes. Police have not yet found any evidence to corroborate his claims, and the investigation continues. It is worth mentioning that there are still supporters of Miller's innocence to this day. Some don't believe he could have committed Rebecca's murder without any motive. Others think that Rebecca's boyfriend could have actually killed her and Miller helped him dispose of the body. Some also believe that Miller didn't kill any other woman and made a false confession to the police for some reason. However, all these versions lack any substantial evidence, so Miller's guilt in Rebecca's murder is not questioned at the official level, while further investigations are ongoing regarding the other allegations. Kirsten Hatfield was born on February 12, 1989, in Midwest City, Oklahoma. The girl's father left the family right after her birth, 
leading their mother, Shannon, to move to her parents' house. They helped her raise the child, and when Kirsten turned two, they moved to their own home. Later, Shannon got married again, and her second daughter, Faith, was born. This marriage also didn't last long, leaving the woman to raise her daughters alone. Despite her young age, Kirsten helped her mother take care of her younger sister. Thanks to this, she became very independent and got along pretty well with Faith. The girls shared a bedroom while their mother slept in the next one. On the evening of May 13, 1997, when Kirsten was eight years old and her sister, three, Shannon prepared the girls for sleep. Usually, she reads them a story, but this time, Faith had already fallen asleep and the woman didn't want to wake her. She wished her older daughter a good night and went to her bedroom, leaving the door to the girls' room slightly ajar. She did this every night in case either of the girls woke up and called her. Somewhere around 3 a.m., Shannon was awakened by a noise coming from her daughter's room. Thinking the girls had woken up, she went to their room. However, as soon as she reached the corridor and approached the door to their bedroom, the noise stopped. Assuming the girls had gone back to sleep, she decided not to wake them and was about to return to her room. But before she did, something strange caught her eye. The door to the girls' room was completely closed, although Shannon always left it slightly open. She thought one of the girls might have closed the door, or she herself had forgotten to leave it open. Shannon approached the door, opened it slightly, but didn't enter the room, then went back to sleep. The next morning, around 6.30 a.m., Shannon went to wake the girls. She entered their bedroom and found that only her younger daughter, Faith, was in bed. She woke her up and asked where Kirsten was, but Faith didn't know. The woman immediately began searching the entire house, but the girl was nowhere to be found. She looked outside, then called all of her friends, whose children Kirsten was friends with. She hoped the girl had gone to one of them, but they all said they hadn't seen her. After that, Shannon called her father, who lived nearby. Her last hope was that the girl had gone to him, but he also hadn't seen her. Realizing that Kirsten had disappeared, he told Shannon to call the police and went to their house. So, the woman called 911, and officers arrived at the scene within a few minutes. Initially, they thought the girl might have been hiding somewhere in the house or had gone for a walk. In their quiet town, there had never been a case of a child being abducted from their own bedroom, so the local police had never encountered anything like it. However, soon the officers realized the situation was much more serious. Upon inspecting Kirsten's room, they found the window slightly ajar with a few drops of blood on the frame. The police went outside and began examining the area around the window. A few yards away, they discovered a piece of children's underwear on the ground stained with blood. The officers asked Shannon to confirm that it belonged to her daughter, and she recognized it. Investigators realized they were likely dealing with a kidnapping, and more officers were immediately called to the scene. When they searched the area behind and around the house, police questioned the girl's mother. She recounted waking up at 3 a.m. after hearing a noise. Suddenly, she realized that at that moment, an unknown criminal was likely abducting Kirsten. The search around the house yielded no results, and the police started interviewing all residents in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, none of them saw or heard anything suspicious that night. The only lead detectives could gather was that one of the neighbors was awakened by a dog barking around 3 a.m., coinciding with the time of the abduction. Failing to find any solid leads, investigators turned to a child psychologist to speak with Faith. Despite being only three years old, she shared that she had witnessed the abduction. However, she kept repeating only one phrase, a bad person came and took my sister. This once again confirmed that the girl did not leave the house willingly, but it provided no further clues to identify the perpetrator or locate Kirsten. Detectives had to restart the investigation practically from scratch. Their initial suspicion leaned towards someone who knew Kirsten well, as it seemed unlikely that a stranger could abduct her from her own room without a sound. 
Working on this theory, police discovered that the girl's mother had a history of drug-related problems. The detectives considered the possibility that the abduction might be related to this. Perhaps the mother owed money to some people in the criminal underworld, and they decided to take her daughter as payment. The alternative was even more chilling. The police did not rule out the mother willingly handing over her daughter. This would explain why the abduction happened almost silently. They spoke with Shannon, but she denied any involvement. She claimed to have been clean from illegal substances for a long period of time and insisted she would never give away her daughter. Detectives didn't rush to clear her of suspicions, but they couldn't find any evidence to support the mother's involvement. So, the police decided to seek the public's help, reaching out through the media, asking people to share any information related to the case. In the following days, the police department received hundreds of calls and detectives diligently followed up on each lead. Most of them were quite superficial and lacked any valuable information. However, investigators soon stumbled upon some disturbing tip. A woman called in, suspecting her boyfriend of being involved in a kidnapping. He had been behaving aggressively, even stating during an argument that if she didn't obey him, he would do to her what he did to Kirsten Hatfield. As the police began investigating this man, they uncovered another alarming fact. He was acquainted with Shannon's brother, meaning Kirsten might have known him. Moreover, the girls and their mother lived in a house that previously belonged to her brother, leading the investigators to believe that the suspect might have been familiar with the layout. The man also had a history that brought him into the police's view, including involvement with drugs and even assault. Everything pointed to him possibly being connected to the crime. However, the man claimed he was at a bar that night. Police verified this information and numerous witnesses confirmed his alibi, placing him at the bar until around 4 a.m., eliminating the possibility of him abducting the girl. Following this, investigators pursued hundreds of other leads, but all of them led to dead ends. The case stretched over months, and with each passing day, hope of finding Kirsten alive dwindled. Her mother couldn't just wait and do nothing as the police repeatedly hit dead ends. From the early days, she tried everything in her power to locate her daughter. She gave interviews to the local media distributed flyers, and even personally investigated various suspects. In her quest for the truth, Shannon faced numerous challenges. For instance, she came up with the idea of reaching out to local businesses in the county, asking them to put flyers about Kristen in their offices, stores, and establishments. To her surprise, many refused, citing it contradicted company policies. She also attempted to secure a meeting with the state governor but it was unsuccessful. Shannon also organized a small center with the goal of attracting volunteers to Kirsten's case. They mainly focused on distributing flyers and engaging with the media, but Shannon encountered new problems. Some volunteers stole money, others lied about the work done, and used the media to draw attention to themselves. Despite all of this, she never gave up trying to unravel the truth for many years. At one point, Shannon realized that the current approach wasn't yielding any results, prompting her to take a different path. She enrolled in college, earned a degree in criminology, and became a parole officer. Shannon chose this path not only to find her daughter's kidnapper, but also to protect others from criminals who might be released from prison and still pose a threat. She strongly believed that the person who took Kirsten had other criminal convictions. In her detailed study of individuals with violent pasts in her town and surrounding areas, she attempted to find any connection to her daughter's abduction. However, in the end, all of these efforts yielded no results. At some point, Shannon resigned herself to the likelihood that Kirsten was probably no longer alive and she would never be able to bring her back. Nevertheless, she never abandoned her quest for answers completely. The police occasionally reopened the case, examining new leads, but it yielded no results. In collaboration with the FBI, they even created a sketch of what Kirsten might look like years after the abduction. No one believed she was still alive, 
yet without her remains, they couldn't declare this with absolute certainty. The stagnation in the case lasted for many years until an unexpected turn of events. In 2014, a woman called the police with a rather bizarre story. Her grandmother had recently passed away, and as she sorted through the remaining belongings, she found a diary. In it, the grandmother detailed how her own son had confessed to killing Kirsten Hadfield. The narrative contained such a wealth of details that detectives had no doubt about the authenticity of the information. According to the diary, the man abducted Kirsten from her bedroom and took her to a nearby town where he owned a house. There, he subjected her to heinous acts and brutally murdered her. The description of the entire process spanned several pages, leaving even seasoned investigators horrified. Furthermore, the diary mentioned that the entire ordeal was recorded on video cassette. Detectives immediately brought in the woman's son for questioning. While they anticipated him denying everything, his words surprised them even more. He claimed no involvement in the crime, but knew who committed it because the girl was killed in his ex-girlfriend's house. This perplexed the police, prompting them to ask the man for the address of this house. Detectives swiftly obtained a warrant and sent in a team to thoroughly examine the property. Their first step involved spraying luminol, a substance that admits a glow upon contact with even the tiniest traces of blood, even if it had been cleaned from the scene of the crime. When the forensic experts did this, they were met with genuine shock. One of them later stated that the entire house lit up like a Christmas tree. The chemical revealed that blood was practically everywhere, and most importantly, the bloodstained patterns matched the gruesome details of the murder described in the diary. Experts removed floorboards, cut out sections of wallpaper, and sent out everything to the lab. They also assembled a team for excavations on the property, hoping to find the girl's body. In addition, the police found a box in the house containing hundreds of video cassettes, prompting them to recall the diary. They knew that one of these tapes should contain footage of the victim being abused. Detectives meticulously reviewed each tape, a process that took countless hours. However, none of the cassettes contained anything relating to the murder. The excavations also yielded no results. There were no remains or any evidence in the soil on the property. But then, the detectives faced the most unexpected twist. Experts analyzing the remains of the bloodstains in the house concluded that the blood belonged to an animal, not a human. This came as an absolute shock to the police, as they were convinced they were finally on the verge of solving Kirsten's case. Instead, investigators faced yet another false lead. What this was exactly remains unknown. Perhaps someone decided to play a cruel joke on the police, or the diary was penned by an individual with mental health issues who saw information about the girl's abduction on the news and believed in a narrative being born in their mind. Nevertheless, detectives continued to hope that sooner or later they would uncover the truth. However, no new leads emerged and the case once again came to a standstill. In the summer of 2015, Kirsten's case was handed over to a new detective named Daryl Miller, who decided to initiate a fresh investigation. He studied all the existing documents and records, and at some point, he noticed something peculiar. To his surprise, Miller realized that over all these years, his predecessors hadn't examined the crucial pieces of evidence, the blood on the windowsill in the victim's room and on her underwear. Although these pieces of evidence were stored in the warehouse for some inexplicable reason, they hadn't been sent to the lab for analysis. Perhaps, back then, the police thought the blood belonged to the girl and analyzing it wouldn't yield any results. Miller decided to rectify this and sent the evidence to the lab. Soon, they called him back, stating that both blood samples belonged not to Kirsten, but to an unknown male. This was a long-awaited breakthrough but the detective faced a new challenge. The abductor's DNA sample was immediately uploaded to the FBI database, but there was no match. This could mean that he hadn't committed serious crimes, or it happened before the database's creation. Nevertheless, Miller was undeterred. 
he decided to collect DNA samples from all the men involved in the case since the abduction. The police compiled a list, located each person, and sent their DNA to the lab. Surprisingly, every individual willingly provided their samples right away. This led investigators to consider that the murderer might have not been part of the case files. Despite this, Miller patiently awaited the results until he finally got a call from the lab. Experts had completed the analysis of one of the samples and found that it perfectly matched the blood found on the victim's windowsill and underwear. The individual was 56-year-old Anthony Palma, a neighbor of the Hatfield family who lived just across the street from them. Palma was one of the first people the police spoke to on the day of the abduction. Back then, he told them he woke up around 3 a.m. due to his dog barking. Now, with confirmation of his involvement, detectives decided to speak with him again. While DNA evidence was more than sufficient for a conviction in court, investigators hoped to extract a confession. Firstly, it would significantly expedite the trial, and secondly, only he knew where Kirsten's body was, making it nearly impossible to locate her remains without his cooperation. Detectives chose to proceed cautiously. They invited Anthony for questioning, stating it was a routine process. Supposedly, they were re-interviewing everyone, including neighbors, hoping to gather some new information. In reality, they had a specific task, to get him to admit whether he had ever been inside the Hatfield family home. Initially, detectives asked if he remembered anything else from that night. Anthony recounted the same story as 18 years ago. However, this time, he added a new detail. He allegedly saw a white car parked in front of Kirsten's house, but didn't think much of it. Next, the police inquired about his familiarity with the girl and her family. Anthony said he knew them as neighbors, but never interacted with Kirsten personally. He added that during those years, he got along well with other neighborhood kids. For instance, they occasionally asked him to fix their bikes or stopped by for candy. Subsequently, the police asked if he had ever been inside Kirsten's house. Perhaps the girl's mother had asked him for help or he had visited just to chat. However, Anthony claimed he had never been inside the house while the family lived there. For the detectives, this became a crucial moment for the interrogation. Considering the man's blood was found on the windowsill from the victim's room, they had just caught him in a lie. Thanks to this, in court, he wouldn't be able to claim that the blood got there under different circumstances, like when he visited the neighbors on another day. However, there was a problem. The house where Kirsten lived had previously belonged to Anthony's friend, and he admitted to visiting it during those years. But the blood sample on the windowsill was clearly fresh and couldn't have been left there many years ago. However, detectives decided to move on to the main part and informed him that his blood was found in Kirsten's room and on her underwear. Anthony began denying this, repeating that he had never been inside their home. Investigators tried to extract a confession, but he consistently stuck to his denial. Then, they opted to change tactics and left the room. Detective Miller entered to speak with Anthony. He brought along a photo of Kirsten, placing it on the table in front of the suspect. Anthony immediately pushed it away and avoided looking at the photo for the rest of the conversation. Miller asked him various questions, hoping Anthony would eventually slip up, but he continued to deny everything. Realizing they wouldn't extract a confession, the police decided to finish the interrogation and arrested the man. Following this, they obtained a search warrant for his house, thoroughly excavated the entire area, but couldn't find any trace of the girl's remains or any other evidence. During the trial, Anthony persisted in denying his involvement, but the results of the DNA analysis spoke for themselves. In court, additional details emerged that police had overlooked during the initial investigation. It turned out Anthony had prior run-ins with the law. Several years before Kirsten's abduction, he had intruded into another girl's bedroom and assaulted her. He had also been imprisoned in the 80s for a weapon-related attack. This further underscored Anthony's status as a dangerous criminal, but for some reason, his past convictions were overlooked in 1997. In late 2017, the jury found him guilty of Kirsten's abduction and murder, sentencing Anthony to life in prison. 
Throughout the trial, he never revealed the location of her remains, and the police doubt they'll ever find the girl. The problem lies in Anthony's employment with the park services. Familiar with remote areas, he could have buried the body where investigators might never reach. Nevertheless, the victim's mother persisted in trying to find her daughter. She regularly called Anthony and visited him in prison, spending hours seeking answers. With each interaction, she felt the criminal was getting closer to disclosing the body's whereabouts, but it never happened. In early 2019, Anthony was killed by his cellmate, driven by personal animosity stemming from Anthony's crime against a child. As a result, the Kirsten family's sole hope to locate the girl's body rests on the chance that hunters or travelers may stumble upon it in remote national parks. All right, guys, please share your thoughts on this story in the comment section, and don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.